Uh, good morning. We are glad you're with us today. Glad the snow went south of us. <laughs> or if you wanted the snow, we're sorry the, south, the snow went south of us. <laughs> Whichever, we're agreeable to whatever your opinion is. But I know one thing, I'm glad to be here today. Glad you're a part of our gathering together. We began a series three weekends ago about changed lives, about changing lives, about the fact that that's the theme this year for our church. We want to really emphasize change lives. One of our ladies came up to my wife and I after services last night, and there were tears in her eyes, and she said, um, she said in the middle of the song service, uh, she said, I, I could just, there, there was just something, she said, in the middle of the song service, I accepted Christ as Savior. <laughs> And it was just so exciting to be able to talk with her. And she'd been struggling with that, and it's settled now. She knows that Christ is her Savior, and she belongs to Him. But that's what we want to see happen in our church always. And God is doing that, and God wants to continue to do that. And so what we're trying to do is really emphasize how changed lives can take place and to make sure that the whole ministry of our church, not just during this year but in years to come, are focusing on people being changed by the power of God. There's three areas that we're emphasizing. One of those is salvation, one is leadership, and one of them is relationships. And I want to share with you the story this morning of a young lady who has experienced change in her lives. Chelsea Whitley is going to be walking this direction. We appreciate Chelsea, and let's just welcome her. Show appreciation as she comes to the platform. How are you today, Chelsea? Very. I'm good, I'm good. Well, there's been some changes in your life as the years have gone by. So why don't we start off, um, when you were younger, uh, there were some challenges that were in your home. Tell us about those challenges. Well, um, as long as I can remember, my mother was not, was always, has always been sick. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen my mother walk on her own. Either she's had a cane or a walker or a wheelchair. And growing up, that's hard because, you know, you want your mom to bake you cookies and do things like that. But she wasn't able to do those no, things. She wasn't. Uh, mm. And that probably added some responsibilities for you and maybe your siblings. Yes. Um, I have two sisters, an older sister and a younger sister. Um, my younger sister and I were in charge because my dad had to work, you know, all day to pay for medical bills and, you know, putting food on our table and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it fell on our sisters to take care of the things that, you know, a mother traditionally does. So that meant that me and my younger sisters would clean the house and we would make sure everything was, you know, cleaned up and stuff like that. And then my older sister was in charge of cooking dinners at night and like getting me and my sister ready for school and taking us to school sometimes when my dad couldn't. So mm -hmm. there's that. So there were a lot of responsibilities you had to carry as a young person. Yes. And then as your mother got, you know, even worse, as I guess her sickness advanced, that added even more responsibility. I mean, like, did y'all have to take care of her personally? Well, uh, when I was about 15, my mother was hospitalized for the first time. Um, so she was put in the hospital because she was dehydrated and she couldn't feed herself anymore. So what that meant was that the doctors put a feeding tube into her and me and my sisters were in charge of feeding her. We would have a little can and we would feed her every couple of hours. That also meant that my mom couldn't go to the bathroom on her own. So that fell on a 15 year old to carry a woman to the bathroom to help her do those things that usually you can do on your own. Right. Mm. So basically most of the years that you remember taking care of house duties and helping take care of your mom was kind of like a daily assignment that you had. Yes. Mm. So how did you feel about this? Did, did that create a barrier between you and God? Was there anger? What kind of emotions did you have? I was definitely angry. When you're growing up and you see all these, you know, all your friends, their mom can do the, go to the grocery store, can answer the door when need be. It's hard to see that because you don't understand it, especially at that age of why her? My mom was a beautiful, precious woman, and it didn't make sense to me that God put that on her, that he put that on our family. I was mad. I was confused. I didn't understand any of it. Mm. And I want to pause right here. You know, we have heard stories in the last few weeks from someone maybe who had had a drug addiction or uh, there had been other errors in their life that were difficult. 
But the challenges of life are not always an addiction. I mean, there are other things that also can be a stumbling block in our lives and a stumbling block in our relationships with God. And that's why I think Chelsea's story is so, so powerful. Well, you finally left home. Tell yes. us about that and where you went. Well, I'm from Arlington, Texas originally. And um, I was 18 and I decided that I didn't want to live that life anymore. That my parents could do their own thing and I was going to be on my own. So I went to the college that I thought was far enough away that we could still pay for. And that happened to be WT. Okay. Um, and I was like, I got to put as much distance as I can between that part of my life and what I thought was the new improved part of my life, which that also meant that everything that my parents had taught me, because I had grown up in the church, uh, I knew who God was always. But to me, he was something that was mean and didn't make sense. So I turned 18. I was like, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go out and drink and I'm going to party and none of that matters. And I know what's best for me. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened with your mom in the meantime? Because, what, your younger sister taking care of her? Yes. Um, that My older sister had eventually moved out and gotten married, and that left, once, once I left, that left my younger sister and my dad to take care of my mother, which they couldn't do it on, a, on you know, their own, so they decided to put my mom into a nursing home. Um, and at that point in time, I was furious. I was guilty more than anything else because I was like, here I am, selfish, and I can't even be at home and take care of my own mom. Yeah. Mm. Well, so you moved to Canyon, Texas, yep. uh, kind of out on the edge of the world so that you would uh, be able yep. to get away from there. And um, went to WT. What's happened in your life since then? Uh, well, since then, my mother passed away in 2010. Um, and at that point, I just kind of lost it. It was hard to keep it together. Um, my mom always was praising Jesus, always. And when I got to be about 22, I realized that the way that I was in my life wasn't right. God was always there with me. And it was hard to see it then, but now it's, it's obvious, I guess. It's obvious that he guided me through some of the <clears throat> things that I shouldn't have been doing. It's obvious now that, you know, my mom being sick was, there was a reason behind it. I don't necessarily know it now, but I know that there is. And I know that now my mom is dancing up there with Jesus. Amen. How can Amen. I not be happy? Yeah, How can I not love right. that God? Mm -hmm. And so then I came to Family Life uh, about last year in February um, after I had, you know, kind of looked at other churches, you know, trying to see where I wanted to fit. And then I came mm -hmm. here um, and I was like, yeah, this is where I need to be. Uh -huh. This is where God has put me. I I have to be here. Amen. Well, we're glad you're here. Yeah. We are glad you're a part of us and of our church family. Wait, wait, wait. Come back. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we praise God that Chelsea has experienced the changes she has experienced. The changes that helped her come to grips with that pain from her mother's sickness, from that phase that she was away from God. It's an awesome story, and we love you, and we're glad you're a part of us. Bless you, yeah. sister. Amen. Change lives. Man, you know, sometimes ministry is work. Sometimes it is tiring. Sometimes it is frustrating. But when you hear a story like that, it's worth it all. And we praise God for that. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay, I said that there's salvation, there's leadership and relationship. Three areas to focus on during this year and to really try to build stronger ministry structures that will continue to bless our church in time to come. So today, we're going to talk about leadership. And I want to go ahead and go to the scripture that our remarks are going to be based on, and it's 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to talk about the leadership within the church. Now, that might immediately turn the light switch off in your mind. Like, okay, leadership in the church, boring, I don't need to hear about that. Well, you need to understand that leadership is more than just a handful of people. And that's kind of the direction we're going. This is not a message just for the staff and the elders and the deacons. This is a message for everyone in this room. Because you're either a leader or you're a follower. And there's nothing wrong with being a follower if that's the role that you're supposed to play. But it's important to know how in a church setting the, the ministry is done and, and how leadership takes place. 
Now, in the block near the top of the page, there are a couple of write-ins, and I'm going to share those with you. And uh, the first thing I want you to notice is the church needs leaders. The church needs leaders. If you're taking notes, write that in. The church needs leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul talks about leaders. He says, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. He's saying it's a noble task. It's a way of saying it's a good thing. Leadership in a church is a great thing. And then he goes on to say, now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, and so forth. And he talks about managing his household, uh, about being a mature Christian, having a good reputation. All of that is there in the next several verses. But the thing I want you to notice is he says overseer. Now, Those of you who took English grammar at some time or another in your life, tell me when he says overseer, is that plural or is that singular? (laughs) Overseer. There is no S on the end of it. Plural or singular? Plural means two or more. Singular means one. Is it plural or singular? Singular. That's exactly right. Now that that leads us to a question. Is he implying that in a church setting, an overseer is what's needed, but it's just one person? Now, you'll notice in the notes I said, a church needs leaders. I didn't say a church needs a leader. I believe there ought to be a key leader in a church setting, but at the same time, there are others that need to lead with them. Well, I put leaders plural, and I want you to hold your place at 1 Timothy and turn about five pages over pages over, to a book called Titus, chapter 1 of Titus. And what we find is almost the same passage. Probably Titus and 1 Timothy were written at the same time. And Titus is just a little bit briefer, but I want you to notice there how he speaks. He's spoken of the overseer, singular, in 1 Timothy, but now in chapter 1 of Titus, verse 5, he says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint, somebody tell me what he says, appoint, Elders, is there an S on the end of it? Yes, there is. Elders. Elders, overseers, it's all referring to the spiritual leaders of the church. The, put, to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he goes on and he says about the same. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, over managing his household, things like that. You can tell he's speaking of the same people. But now it's plural. So we're going to come to the next write-in, and that is a church needs many leaders. So it's not just simply true to say a church needs leaders. A church needs many leaders. Now, this is why this message is important for our church at this time. If you're a part of our church, if you're considering becoming a part of a church, our church, or if you're a part of some other church, this message is important for you. It's going to be kind of dealing with church issues. But you know what, guys? When you see people like Chelsea with the changed life, the lady who accepted Christ last night, church issues aren't, in, aren't boring at all. It's interesting. It's exciting because eternity is being changed by that. So... We're going to talk about leaders, and our church needs many leaders. Now, we have have the the lead pastor, the senior pastor. We have about 12 people who are paid employees, either part-time or full-time, for our church. And they are all certainly leaders. In addition to that, we have elders, and we have deacons, and, and they are definitely leaders. We have people who lead particular ministries, and they obviously are leaders. But you know, just naming those, we're already in the 20s, maybe 30 on the number of leaders. And many of those spouses may not have the title, but they have the role, and they play a vital part in their ministry. So we may be talking about 50 people right there. But then there's another ministry in our church that needs many leaders, and that's the life group ministry. The life group ministry where small groups get together, study the word, build relationships, fellowship, minister to each other, gain strength from each other. And, you know, guys, there we need a lot of leaders. Somebody guess, if you were here last night, don't even guess. Somebody guess how many adults are a part of our church family. Just just pull the number out of the air, say out loud so that I can hear it. 900? 800, what? How many did you say? 
1,200, okay. Those are all some great guesses. The actual fact is just about 800 adults are a part of Family Life Church. Either official members, they've taken 101, or regular attendees. 800 adults. Now let's suppose we're going to have life groups to minister to all 800. I mean, ideally, that's how it ought to be. No, let's don't even do that. Let's suppose that we only had life groups for one-third of those. Now, let's make one half. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of being a woman right now. I can't make my mind up. Um, <laughs> Now, don't ever quote me on that. (laughs) That just came out, you know, without forethought at all. Let's suppose we're going to have enough life groups for 400 people. Now, how many life groups, how many people could we put in each life group? We're going to be generous. We're going to say 20 people. A lot of groups really ought to be 10 to 15, but we'll say 20 people out of 800, out of For 400 people, half the people of the church. Okay, so if we have 20, that means we need 20 life groups. That is for the size that our church is right now. We would need at least 20 life groups, but we have 12 life groups for our church. That means that eight groups aren't meeting or don't exist times 20. There's 160 people who might be willing to be involved, but we don't have life groups for them. But guys, my goal is not to see 50% involved in a life group. If we had really the ideal of all people, all of our adults in life groups, that would be uh, 40 life groups that would be needed. That means we are short 28 life groups. And that means we need leaders. And that means, guys, we need people who are growing spiritually, growing in knowledge of the Word of God, growing and learn how to have an impact on other people's lives, and then who are willing to say, I will lead, I will minister, I will lead a life group, or I will serve in other directions. You see, leaders are needed. And maybe you're supposed to be one of those new life group leaders. Maybe you're supposed to be a ministry leader. We need a singles ministry. We need a leader or leaders for that. We need a more organized or more active college ministry. We need leaders for that. But we need a women's ministry. We need leaders for that. Leadership is needed. And for this church to grow and the goal that we have to build a larger facility, what are we going to do five years from now when it's not a church of a 1,000? It's a church of 2,000, and we still need life group leaders. We're not going to lead another, need another 10 or 20 life group leaders. We're not going to need another 50 or 60 life group leaders. And what good is it going to be to build a larger facility that will hold people unless our ministry is there with leaders in place that's able to minister to those people? I'm not interested in having a building that you can pack people into. I'm interested in being a church that is a family that touches people's lives and changes people's lives. And that's not done by buildings. That is done by people ministering to people, giving her their heart. That means we have to have leaders. And that means this message is important. And what I want to do is walk our way through what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 and just take note of some of the things that Paul has to say about leaders. This needs to challenge us, and it needs to instruct us. It needs to be a list of things that we can look at and say, I want to be true to that. The first one is this. Paul is going to tell us that a leader must be willing. Verse 1, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. What Paul is saying is, it is okay to want to be a leader. You know, sometimes people think we're supposed to be humble. Now, are Christians supposed to be humble? You don't know how to answer. Yeah, we are supposed to be humble. Because we recognize that our salvation rests on the Lord and not on us. We recognize the blessings God given us in our lives is not by our efforts. It is by the hand of God. But sometimes people are too humble for their own good and for the good of the kingdom of God. And here's what I mean. A lot of people, when given a chance to serve, will say, I can't do it. When given a chance to lead, will say, I'm not a leader. And they think they're being humble and they're honoring God by saying, no, I won't do it. Someone else is more qualified. 
God's kingdom does not need people who disappear into the background saying somebody else would do a better job, but rather people who will step forward and say, I will serve and I don't know if I'm ready for it, but God will grow me and God will use me and I will serve. That's how it has to happen for a church to have a ministry that touches lives. We must be willing You know, to be willing means we've got a heart that says, I want to serve and I want to be a part of the work of God. And guys, that also means that we don't aspire to a title. We aspire to a ministry. You see, if you're willing, you're going to go beyond the title. If you're willing, you're going to apply yourself and do the task, do the ministry that ought to be done. Titles are a dime a dozen. You can go online and buy a title to anything. You could be an ordained ministry minister before this day is over. If you just go to the right or the wrong website on the online, you can do. You can have all things, all kinds of things. I made a joke of it last night. Later, I thought that was about the goofiest thing I ever did. But you know, maybe not as bad as saying that I think like a woman sometimes. But um, I said, you know, if you want a title. We will make you a knight of the round table. You know, here it is, right? (laughs) You know, we will declare you a sir or a lady, whatever. I mean, we can give titles to people. The problem is work and ministry and change lives don't come about by titles. In fact, sometimes the people who are most influential are people who don't have a title, who aren't an elder, who aren't a deacon, or aren't a staff person, aren't a pastor. It's people that just have a heart for other people and go out there and try to love and influence and bring people to Christ and help people grow in the Lord. Don't worry about the title. Worry about your life. Think about your life touching other people's lives for the sake of Christ. A leader must be willing. Second thing that Paul says, that a leader must be a follower of Christ. We're going to look at a couple of verses starting at 2. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. What Paul is doing is naming some qualities that ought to be a part of this man or woman's life, character, the integrity of this person, and saying this is what you should be like. If you're going to be a leader. And the whole point that he's making is there has to be godliness. There has to be the presence of Christ in anyone who is a leader within a church. I I just want you to know something. In family life, we do not choose leaders based on how much money they give to our church. And I want you to know also, I do not know how much the people, the individuals, the the, the givers give, or even who the givers are. You don't give to Dale Travis. And Dale Travis doesn't have any involvement in the financial ministry of our church at all. I can't even sign checks. They won't let me see it. When you give, you're not going to buy a leadership role in our church. And that's how it ought to be. Because there are a lot of churches that will choose leaders based on how much money that they give to the church. And I believe we ought to choose leaders based on spiritual gift, a heart to serve, and a godly lifestyle. And I'm convinced that the giving part takes care of itself for those kind of people. But the goal should be men and women of God. They've got to be a follower of Christ. And then I want to share with you a third point, third principle that Paul shares with us. And that is... A leader must invest in his family first. Before I can minister to this church, I have to minister to my family. And if I'm failing in ministering to my family and to my wife, then I am not fit to be a pastor before of other people also. Notice verse 4. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Now, somehow or another, there has to be a balance. And I'll confess to you, it's one of the hardest things I've ever faced. And that is the balance between ministering to the church and still giving time to the family. 
Some of us were joking the other day and talking about pictures, you know, someone showing a picture of their house and, and the comments that we made were, show a picture of this house. Well, Bob lives there. Picture of this house. Joe lives there. Picture of this house. Kathy lives there. And then someone said, a picture of the church. I said, Dale lives there. <laughs> And it seems to be the case sometimes. But guys, I've got to have my life and my ministry in balance. My wife is sick this morning. She is home. And maybe a migraine coming on, so say a prayer for Linda. But she, she always feels reluctant, even when she's sick, to not be here because she is a strength to me and an encouragement to me. But I have a responsibility when she is sick to say, it is okay for you to stay home because your welfare is more important than you being here to do the task that you do. And I said, stay home. And she did. And, and, and I'm at peace with that, except I just want her to be okay. Sometimes pastors ignore their children. There's kind of a reputation that churches have had that the worst kids in a church are the preacher's kids. We don't have to worry about that nowadays. My kids are all grown. Well, maybe we do have to worry about that nowadays. But anyway, I just know this. I used to hear when I was younger, the reason the church members had such bad kids is because they played with the preacher's kids. <laughs> That's maybe a joke, but there's a lot of truth in that. But a lot of times it is because pastors are so busy. Linda shared with me, about the church that she grew up in, and she said the pastor lived at the church, even though his wife and family lived at home. He took a bath in the baptistry. He had his meals in the church kitchen, and that was literally where he spent most of his time. And that's horrible. A family is the first ministry, and if a person, a man or woman, are not ministering to their family, they're disqualified from ministering and leading in the church setting. And that's what Paul is showing. You've got to be able to know first how to manage your own family. And then you'll be maybe qualified to manage and lead the church of the Lord. So a leader must invest in his family first. Number four, a leader must be spiritually mature. Paul tells us this in verse 6. He must not be a recent convert or he, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. You see, for a lot of people, it's kind of an ego boost to be in a leadership role. Being a leader is not something to boast and to feel prideful about. Being a leader means that we have become a servant. And we're supposed to serve Christ and serve others. But guys, we have to have a heart that, that recognizes no matter how excited someone is, no matter how motivated they are, they need to grow a while before they become a leader within the church family. And, and I, I've seen some of the most, the, the most enthusiastic servants of Christ to be among new believers. But the greatest disfavor we could give to a, an enthusiastic new believer is to say, why don't you take this leadership role? It takes time to face the ups and downs, those attacks from Satan and survive those attacks and those difficulties and survive those difficulties and on and on. And it takes time. In most cases, it takes years. So we need to keep in mind, we must be growing. We must be, be becoming spiritually mature if we want to be leaders among God's people. And then number five, the last point I want to make, and that is a leader must be consistent. A leader must be consistent. He tells us in verse 7, he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. A good reputation outside, people that aren't believers, what he is saying is what he is at home, what he is at work, what he is at, in his neighborhood ought to match up with what he is at church. We ought to be the same person everywhere. Now I want to share with you that we have some awesome leaders in our church. And I praise God for every one of those. And I want to introduce some of those leaders to you. And we're going to do this by slides. We have a group of men in our church that we call elders. It doesn't mean they're old. It doesn't mean they're not old. It just means that they are mature men of God. It means that they are men who are leaders by heart, by, by passion, by lifestyle. It means as best we know that they are faithful. We require these men to be faithful in attendance. 
uh, to be a part of a life group, to tithe, basic requirements. But there's something else, and this is very important, and that is they don't minister alone. I believe that the elder ministry ought to be a couple's ministry, and the wives ought to be right there with those men of God serving together. Because there are times that someone needs counseling. There's times someone in the hospital needs to be visited. And it's just not always the best setting for a man to be ministering alone. But the husband and wife can serve together. And there are a lot of times you just need a gentle voice. Ladies, I'm trying to get brownie points now. There's times to have the tenderness and the sweetness of a Christian lady's presence. Say amen. Okay. All right. And, and, and a wife can help in that. So I want to share as couples... Photos on the screen of our elders, and we'll just let you meet them one by one. Rick and Jackie Chaddock. Mickey and Kayla Ebenkamp. Bobby and Vicki Farrington. Dan and Melissa Mercer. Tommy and Jana Scott. CM and Leslie Sims. Richard and Sheila Sims. Terry Spone. He doesn't have a wife, but we're looking for one for him. <laughs> we said, if you don't choose one quick, we'll just choose one for you. Randy and Agonishka Weber. These are our nine elders, and they are great men of God. I thank God for them. And just express your appreciation for these guys. I want to explain the role of the elders. While four of the elders are on the church board, the primary role for the elders is to uh, minister to the people of our church, to pray for the people, to call people, to go see them in the hospital, to make a phone call, to send a card, to visit among our people here, to show love and consideration. And sometimes people say, who is my elder? You don't have an elder. You have nine elders. You can call any of them. You can lean on any of them. And while each of these elders have a contact list so that we can stay in touch with the people of the church, you can call on any of these and they will be there to serve you and they'll pray for you. They're great men and women of God. Now we also have a ministry called deacons and the deacons are like assistants to our elders. Uh, They are on on an average a little bit younger and, and on an average probably been in the church a less period of time. And they are men and their wives working with them who minister to our shut-ins, to the elderly, help with our benevolent ministry, and also assist the elders in whatever way. And I decided for the deacons to use a little more informal photos. So the first one is Jason and Delisa Hendrick. And then there is Bob and Lacey Jellison. I think maybe deacons have more fun than elders do. I don't know. Ed and Sherry Moffitt. Caleb and Sarah Regino, <laughs> Bill and Kathy Sweeney, Darren and Crystal Taylor, <laughs> and Blake and Kristen Wolbeck. <laughs> and these are awesome men and ladies. That's show appreciation for them. <laughs> now, here's how you guys need to respond to this message. You need to consider where the God intends for you to become a leader here at Family Life. One day, because our numbers will continue to increase, we'll be hiring more staff. And we so much rather hire from within the church than from outside the church. We prefer for it to be people we know and that we have seen their walk with God and their responsibility than to choose someone that somebody recommends and that we read on about in a resume. We're going to need more leaders in that respect. We're going to need more life group leaders. We're going to need more elders and deacons because as the church grows, there'll be the need for more people. And if in another five years, this church is much larger than it is now, cry, the crying need of now is for people to be growing in leadership. But you know, more life groups, pray about it. Pray about whether God wants you to be a leader or not. But then pray for the leaders of this church. It is not easy to be a leader. It takes a lot of time. There's frustration. Sometimes we don't please people and we we feel down on ourselves because we love to show love. And we love to have people pleased and to feel encouraged. You need to pray for us. 
and pray that God will make the unity of the leaders always strong and pray that this church together like a family will have people who lead, people who follow, their eyes on Christ, their hearts on souls, their desire to honor and glorify Christ Jesus so that we continue to see changed lives year after year after year until the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes again. Now let's bow our heads. And let's consider what our role needs to be. No matter what, we've got to be people of prayer. No matter what, every one of us ought to be growing. And many of you who are not yet leaders in this church need to become leaders. And it's not only a title, like I said. It is sometimes your, your, your whole bearing and mannerism because there are many people who don't have a title who have a lot of impact on others for eternity's good. And Father, I pray that this will be a church where leaders are trained. I pray you'll bless this class 501 this afternoon as about 15 or so people come together and learn more about how to be leaders. I pray, Father, for future 501s that there'll be a flood of people coming to that and people learning to be leaders and willing to lead in the context of this church family. I pray, Father, that you will protect those who are in leadership, protect us from temptation, protect us from anything that will cause our lives to drift in the wrong direction. Help us to live your li our lives for your glory. And I pray, Father, that truly the men and women of God who are leaders in this church will be listening to the voice of Christ, will be serving together as a team, and will be leading this church in the way that will please you. And Father, I pray for the one who has come today and leadership in a church is the last thing in the world they needed to hear about because right now they are on a road that's going to lead to hell because they are lost without Christ. They're not a Christian yet. But they came today because they wanted to hear more. They wanted to learn more. And let me pause in my prayer while your heads are bowed. If you have not yet made a decision that Jesus will be your Savior, that you will believe in Him, you will trust in Him, and you will let Him be your Lord for the rest of your lives and for eternity, then you need to make that decision today. And I invite you to make that decision as I close in just a moment. Close my prayer. And that is, right now, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? And would you, through prayer, invite Him into your life and ask Him to give you eternal life because of Christ who died on your behalf? Father, I pray that someone will ask for that, pray for that right now, like that young lady did last night. And I pray that there will be new believers walking out of this building in just a few minutes. Now, Father, our prayer is that all that's been said and done today will serve for your glory. We thank you for being among us. And we pray in Jesus' name.